Well, I, I think it's difficult to underestimate the, uh, the tremendous amount of information that we all received, so it was my difficult task not only to open on behalf of Marty Stevens uh, the um, meeting, but also to close with some concluding remarks. And again, I think we had a number of uh, folks, especially those uh, uh, who've been managing the question and answer periods and the panels, but I nonetheless try to synthesize them and intersperse them with some additional thoughts. So as uh, Joyce already said, it's been a tremendous meeting. I want to tip my hat to not only speakers and panelists and NRC staff and the committee, but also the audience, because really the success of this particular format of a meeting is in the discussion rather than the presentations, and it was clearly obvious to me that most of the time and I think most of the ideas that really resonated broadly were brought up in the discussion, and that's why we have these meetings, and that's why we record them and make them available. So. I already put this uh, um, up at the last slide at, in my opening, and um, the aims of this meeting were not only, again, to bring up the state of science and to discuss the horizons. Um, that's why I was harping on, you know, what's within one year, what's within three years, what's within ten years, because. Uh, in reality, we need the realistic appraisal of the challenges and communicate them to stakeholders and really understand how this really, really interesting and beautiful science is going to make its way one day, hopefully, into the practice and the application. And this is one area where I think, unlike many others that we've uh, considered before in this committee, really the stakes are high. Not only because there are some very, uh, you know, high and uh, you know, powerful and uh, well-spoken individuals like Dr. Austin, who are not afraid to go to Congress and dangle the chip in front of uh, uh, congressmen and uh, and demand more funding for this type of science, but. It's not just the government who is investing tremendous amount of money into this, but also, you know, walking back uh, with uh, Tony Behinsky, um, you know, he told us that uh, the founder of the WIS uh, Institute uh, just keeps funding the WIS Institute, and the funding amounts are very large, to say the least. So there is a true private-public partnership in really pushing this type of science. So I think it's not an underestimate to say that the stakes are high to get this right because the cost of failure is going to be not catastrophic, but very, very tremendous. So our first session was really meant to, you know, set the stage, and, uh, you know, I don't mean any disrespect to, you know, Tony's presentation, but really one of the challenges that has been, I think, painstakingly um, researched for the decades before we started putting cells on these models is really the the fluidics and the engineering of the system itself. So before we can talk about the human on the chip, we really need to understand not just how to connect these systems, but also how within each of these systems all of this works, whether you make it breathable, whether you make it perfusible, whether you make it imageable. All of that is very important, and this is something that biologists are frequently not are very good at thinking about. So the partnerships with engineers and with um, material scientists is really uh, something that I think no other field of biology, except for perhaps you know, microarrays and some other newer technologies, really enjoyed. So uh, again, we all have to tip our hat to those biologists who are not afraid to go and interact with folks who are very, very different in their thinking and in their training. And likewise, the biology of what we're going to put into this plumbing system is also very important. So Kyle did a great job in explaining what frontiers are there with both the primary cells and the induced pluripotent stem cells and what types of tissues and what types of organs we can now reproduce on the tissue chips. And then finally, Wei Shui really you know, tried to show us how difficult it is to define proper nails for some of these systems and where the human health assessment of chemicals, whether it's drugs or environmental chemicals, is really a very fine balance. And the regulators really have probably the hardest job of us all to actually being on the last line and making decisions with all of the information that is being provided by biologists. 
So the second session was on the state of development, and again, um, this is a uh, tremendously interesting area from uh, some of the systems that are not necessarily a chip, such as cardiomyocytes, to you know liver, uh, kidney tubules, uh, you know some of the more complex organizations of reproductive system and other uh, types of organs. There's clearly a tremendous amount of progress that has been made in uh, developing these variety of not only 3D but also other, you know, 2D-like microphysiological systems that represent the majority of human organs and tissues. I think we've only identified two large gaps, which is the nervous system and the male reproductive system that are really being neglected right now, but um, I think it's very, very um, remarkable that a variety of different organs you know, more or less complex are now being in the works, so to speak. And technical challenges are many, and we'll touch on those, but I took out from this meeting that the basic design and biological principles have been largely resolved. Again, I want to stress the word basic, because really these systems work, and these systems, you know, have live cells, and these cells survive for very long times, and these cells function almost like they're supposed to function in a normal tissue or organ. But the next frontier in the basic challenges is really to put all of these together and both the, um, the DARPA groups and the NCATS consortia really are thinking about how to really interconnect these. And I think this is the major next frontier that the biologists and the engineers are really trying to address. So the third session was on the scientific considerations as to where is the state of the science and as uh, Lois yesterday already quoted, uh, I believe, Lance saying that these are advanced but prototype. And in that respect, again, multiple organs or tissues are available. The promising cell biology advances to reconstruct the organ-specific uh, physiology. And most importantly, there are consortia-wide efforts that really are working together because it's very important to develop protocols, to share information, share knowledge, and to define questions that are being addressed by these models. And I think this is where a lot of the discussion that we've had yesterday and today revolved around. But the challenges are many. And again, I want to use the quote that there are no bad cells, only bad environments. And I think this is true in, uh, in many respects, whether it's a 3D model system or a 2D model system. And I think both yesterday and today, the repeated um, issue that was brought up is about how right is the question and where do these models fit. And this is something that, again, a meeting in a venue like this hopefully is bringing up in not only the regulators and the users of this technology but also the developers because it's very important, in my opinion, that, to make developers think about these before they finalize their model systems. And the technical design challenges come from materials that these systems are made from, uh, whether you have the flow, whether you have oxygen and nutrient supply. And there are a lot of these technical challenges that are very well recognizable, and it's uh, very rewarding to see that folks who develop these model systems appreciate these challenges and are working on them. And biological challenges are equally important. What complement of cells we're putting on these systems. Are we trying to reconstitute all four cell types of all 30 cell types? You know, all of the cell types, cell types that are being recruited into the system. Uh, do these cells uh, have proper maturation state? Or is it okay for them to be, you know, slightly embryonic and, you know, early in development? Or do we want them to be 66 years young, as uh, some of our committee members uh, have pointed out? Um, <laughs> And then uh, the media, I mean, if you're going to put this plumbing all together, you know, the, the same stuff is going to flow through and, uh, you know, maybe some people would like to have mineral water and others will have to have distilled water to drink. But the local utility company really can only provide one supply because all of the tubes are interconnected. And then toxicological considerations, uh, you know, are these chemicals getting into the cells? Uh, what are you doing about you know, excretion and removal. Uh, are you recapitulating toxokinetics that is correct uh, or your materials are binding to plastic? Uh, what are the exposure paradigms? Are we treat once or do we just mix our chemicals with the perfused media? Do we treat, you know, in pulses? What about the long-term uh, 
models. You know, how do we replicate, you know, once a day gavage or mixing the uh, chemical with the animal's feed? And then the practical challenges, I think, are some of the most important in terms of portability and really the uptake of these systems. The cost, is, uh, as we've seen from the investment, is tremendous and likely to be very high. The throughput is, uh, is an issue if we would like to put these, uh, you know, really to the test, even in pharma for targeted testing, it still has to be more than one chemical at a time. The reproducibility not only comes from the cells themselves, but also from different laboratories and then the portability can you really take this from the company and move it to someone else's laboratory? And this is where Francisca Bos uh, and Roche really, you know, going out of their way and importing different technologies and trying to put them to the test shows us that this is very, very challenging, but still possible to do. So the fourth session really comes back to the whole charge to this committee, putting these emerging science discoveries to the test for environmental health decisions and the regulatory considerations and other um, related ch issues that we've discussed today really come back to the slide that Wei Shui showed yesterday where we have to really work with the users to define some of the questions so the researchers and developers understand what these model systems may be or may not be good for. So the number of chemicals without assessments, the variability, uh, the uncertainties, and then supporting some of the decisions, not just you know toxic, non-toxic, but also toxic at which dose or concentration and how many people may be exposed to this. All of these questions are very, very important for the basic biologists to keep in mind. And I hope that this particular meeting actually uh, flashed them out a little better. So, there is always a gap between research and practice, and I think we all appreciate that, and this committee is trying to build some sort of a bridge across this divide. And where the researchers are, and I think a lot of the presentations had conceptual designs in them, and I think that was very fitting, because we have drawings and, uh, you know, researchers are really good at conceptualizing things, but uh, on the other end of the divide, the regulators and the practitioners, and they want something that they can drive, you know, a big truck, you know, across this divide. And this is where, again, the venues like this and the conversations that we've had are really helping us to put this one, you know, one stone or one um, iron link at a time. So, Wei Shui did not know that I put this quote from him from this morning. He just said it again, so I'll drive this home for the third time. I think it's very clear that this particular type of technology, like many other novel technologies, will not be just one thing that's going to make or break the decision-making process. I think it's a toolbox, as we've uh, defined at the very beginning for one of the aims of the meetings, uh, of this meeting, and then that, again, researchers appreciating the fact that not a single thing makes, you know, the decision final, except for maybe a controlled, uh, you know, human clinical trial. Then the conversation about, you know, this technology is better than that technology is probably not the right discussion to have, but just try to think about the context where the advantages and disadvantages are. And again, fit for purpose was brought up by many people, and then again, this is finding the proper nail for this particular hammer, and the bullets here, again, are those that probably we would just to want to leave the, the audience with and, you know, have them on record as the challenges that have been brought up. Again, as we've heard, it's likely that these tools will be used for targeted testing, not for screening. Again, cost and portability and the state of development uh, probably the major reasons. And that they will be very, very important for asking very specific questions, as again, presentation from Roche showed us. This was very, very useful for them to ask some follow-up questions right now with chemicals that they don't have to worry about. But it has to be seen whether they'll be ready to take an investigative compound through the same type of data, because if they have the data, they have to give it over to the FDA at some point. And uh, the both qualitative and most importantly quantitative assessment, not just, you know, looking at some biomarkers in isolation, but thinking about how they can support dose response and other types of decisions, and combining uh, these types of models with the right cellular models, modeling not just variability but also disease states, is really something that is 
probably going to further increase the utility of these particular tools, but again in a very narrow context, and that's I think is very important for us to remember. And then moving forward, I think convince me is something that we've heard from regulators or show me the money. And I think it's reassuring that the regulators are very skeptical people by design. And uh, it will take a village and it will take a long time and it will take a community effort to really bring this to a stage where it will be comparable to the standard as was pointed out. It's, there is no reason to argue which standard is gold or bronze. There is certain practice and then these, all of these novel models are just not there yet because we haven't had enough experience with them. And the qualification of these systems and making them available and making them transparent and making them um, work even though this is a highly competitive state, again is the quote that I would like to use from one of the discussants this morning. Uh, it's a very difficult environment where multiple companies are competing for this technology and probably there will be many providers in the future, but it's very difficult to share when you're trying to protect intellectual property. But at the same time, you need to convince everyone, so for that reason you need to disclose. As we heard yesterday from Roger Curran, you know, you can't just deal with, you know, I can't tell you what's in my media type of discussion because it doesn't matter whether you tell that it's 95% predictive, the black box is never predictive enough. And uh, integrating these advances in in vitro model systems with human extrapolations and with in vivo animal data is also going to be something that, uh, you know, will have to be added to all the laboratory investigation that is now ongoing. So the future is bright in my opinion, but we just need to get there, so we need time. And uh, the uh, uh, sign here on this part of the divide says bridge to the future, and I think we're all realizing that neither a conceptual drawing nor an iron bridge is going to appear, so we have to learn how to walk the rope bridge first and hopefully not fall down. And this communication has to continue, and I hope that many of you will uh, tune in or participate in the next uh, uh, Society of Toxicology annual meeting. And I was just asking for the latest information this morning from uh, staff who's managing the logistics of the meeting. There will be uh, two symposia on the continuing education course that are directly relevant to the topic of this meeting. And I invite you to, you know, come visit, to participate, to ask questions, to interact with folks who will be presenting because I think the science will develop and we all just have to keep up not only our interests but also keep understanding where the future is and how to reach that future so we can bridge this divide. Well, thank you so much again and I hope to see you at our next meetings and I wish you all safe travel and um, again, I appreciate your attention. Thank you so much.